How you doing? Yeah. Woo! American atheists with an eclipse. Man, we are screwed. Uh, b before I actually start, first of all, I don't normally give a title to my talks, but David asked, so I gave it a title, and, and it's called Get Them While We're Young. Uh, but I had the privilege of, of doing an event with James Randi in Vancouver recently, and it's worth telling people that one of, the one of the primary reasons I'm a skeptic, and I think some of you will have heard words fall out of my mouth that have also fallen out of his, is because of his work in skepticism. I am what I am today, in great part to the man you just witnessed, not just with regard to skepticism, but with regard to magic and a number of other things. So one more round of applause for the amazing man. So, my wife and I like to go antique shopping. Uh, on the rare weekends when I'm home, we try to find fun stuff to do, and antique shopping is one of them. You know, I'm, I'm getting older. I'm finding stuff in the antique shops that I had when I was a kid, which <laughs> makes it much weirder than it used to be. Um, but I found this book, and it's called Bible Stories as Told to Very Little Children. It's 80 years old. It's written by Bessie Edmund Andrus. It was printed in 1937. Uh, which means it's younger than Randy, just barely. <laughs> but I, I, I loved it. I, we find stuff like this all the time. I collect all kinds of things. But this book uh, struck a chord with me. You've already heard people talking today about, and yesterday, about good news clubs and other organizations and how their target is, is the children. And I'm going to read some things from this book. And we're going to have a bit of fun. And then I'm going to give advice on parenting when I have no children. But I was a child, and I probably still am, depending on who you talk to. The foreword to this book uh, is what got me started. As soon as I read this foreword, I bought this book, and I poured over it. I will probably get about 23 talks out of this book alone. But I'm going to read you the foreword. These stories are written with the object in view of making the Bible stories as interesting to very little children as the old-time fairy tales are to them. Okay, so we, we're starting to set up some equivalency here. Uh, fairy tales, yeah, okay, I got you. In my many years' experience in telling Bible stories, I found that the small children grew restless and sleepy if historical facts were injected into the Bible stories. <laughs> I'd actually like to see more historical facts injected into Bible stories so that we get some you know, relevance with history, but uh, yeah, kids get tired and sleepy, okay. I found also that the more spiritual the stories were, the better they understood them. It was very clear to these children that evil or error, which are the words she substitutes it through the entire book for Satan, were really nothing in the presence of divine love with a capital L which is the word she substitutes for God. There's a lot of substitution in this book. <laughs> Thus, to tell them that the divine love destroyed evil and not men was to present a consistent God to them whom they could love and obey. For there's no other way. Yeah, yeah, that, that is a hymn. Uh, in telling these stories, I have endeavored to impress upon the child's thought what each Bible character stands for. Abraham for obedience, Moses for meekness. Is killing your, this, like, that, that, it's not that meek, I thought, sorry. Joseph for forgiveness and so on. I have found it wiser not to shock the budding thought by telling any tragic episode connected with Bible stories. <laughs> so the almighty, compassionate, loving savior of the universe has to be softened a bit when you're going to read things for kids. I, I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't think, as others have said, that the Bible should contain anything that should shock the mind of a child. I, uh, if they can throw a picture up on the screen, there it is. I went to the thrift store. You can see this book is the blue one in the middle and the bottom. But I went to the thrift store and I gathered up the first six or seven children's Bibles I could find. Some of them are going to be familiar, some of them you probably haven't seen. This was just a small sample of what was available at the thrift store closest to me 
three days ago. I bought them all for $3. Uh, not the blue book, the blue book's worth a little bit more, but the rest of them were $3 combined. In, in the top center, actually, that's not a children's Bible. It is a fairly impressive book studying the effects of religious teaching on children, specifically with a purpose of how to best tune the message and make it receptive. And it has lots of peer-reviewed scientific studies from sociologists. That was terrifying. Until I realized that, damn it, I can use that book too to figure out how to counter some of this. So, I'm going to read to you from my lovely book, The Story of Obedient Abraham, and then we're going to take a look at what the Bible actually says. <laughs> Once upon a time, because that's the way all Bible stories start. Once upon a time. <laughs> there lived in the Bible days a man named Abraham who always obeyed God in everything that God told him to do. Abraham never asked God, why did he want him to do this, or why did he want him to do that? But just as soon as God told Abraham what to do, Abraham did it at once, including offering up his wife to some guy. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to get what the Bible says till later. <laughs> Abraham had a wife named Sarah, but they did not have any little children, or big children, but we needed to clarify. And God knew that they wanted a baby boy, so God told Abraham that he would give Abraham a baby boy because Abraham had always been obedient to him, and baby girls are not as desirable. <laughs> and God told Abraham and Sarah, his wife, to name the baby boy Isaac. Now when God brought little Isaac to Abraham and Sarah, they loved him so much that Abraham made a big feast for him. Do you know what a feast is? Well, it's a big party where there's a whole lot of good things to eat. And Abraham loved little Isaac so much that it looked like he loved little Isaac more than he loved God. And we all know that we must love God the most of all, the most of all, because God is love and he gives us everything to make us happy. So love came to Abraham and talked with him to find out if Abraham truly loved God more than he did little Isaac. And love told Abraham to bring little Isaac to him. Now God did not really want Abraham to give up little Isaac. But love just wanted to see if Abraham would truly give up little Isaac to God, for love only meant to show Abraham that God was the true father of little Isaac and was taking care of little Isaac all the time. I, I don't, yes, you are the father, I get all those. I didn't, didn't want to include that joke, it's too easy. <laughs> now you remember that Abraham always obeyed God, whatever God told him to do. So when love told Abraham to give him little Isaac, just guess what Abraham said. And he said, yes, he would bring Isaac to God. So you see, Abraham really and truly did love God the most. Now in the Bible days, when the men wanted to show God that they loved him, they would take some meat and put it on a table called an altar, and then they would build a big fire under the altar and roast this meat. But they wouldn't eat the meat, uh, even though it would have tasted so good to them, because they wanted to show God that they could sacrifice for God. Do you know what sacrifice means? It means to give up something else or something else, something you want for yourself, uh, to give up to someone else, sorry, something that you want for yourself. Do you ever make sacrifices? Now you and I know that roasting a piece of meat and giving it up for God is not the way to show God that we love him. But the way to show God that we really love him is for us to be kind and loving to all God's children, to sacrifice error for love, to give up the error for love. You see, these people did not know any better. When they roasted the meat and sacrificed it, they gave it to God. The way that's worded almost makes it seem like she's saying they should just ate it. But <laughs> so when God told Abraham to give up little Isaac and bring him to God, Abraham didn't understand what God meant. For Abraham thought that God meant for him to put little Isaac on the altar or table, just like the men did with pieces of meat. Abraham was just confused. Now, wasn't that funny for Abraham to think that God meant such a thing? You and I know that God did not mean that at all. For God is love, and everything God does is loving and kind and good. And as I told you before, God just meant to teach Abraham to love him more than anyone else in the world. So Abraham put little Isaac on the altar. But all the time, Abraham had faith in God as love, that Abraham knew that God would take care of Isaac. That's why Abraham was not afraid to lay little Isaac on the altar with sticks of wood underneath it. 
And the Bible doesn't say anything about little Isaac being afraid at all. So we know little Isaac wasn't afraid <laughs> because he knew he was God's perfect child and love would not let anything hurt him. Now when Abraham placed little Isaac on the altar and put the sticks of wood under the altar and was ready to light it, guess what happened? <laughs> God sent the loveliest angel to Abraham who took hold of Abraham's hand, took hold of Abraham's hand, it's like, and told him, don't light the fire. And this lovely angel told Abraham that God loved Abraham and God was now sure that Abraham truly loved God most of all. And Abraham lifted up Isaac down from the altar and took him home to his mama, Sarah, and they were all so happy. And Abraham remained always obedient to God. Do you know where you can find this story in the Bible? It's in the book of called Genesis. Well, I have a book called Genesis here. It's actually Genesis 22. And uh, I don't think this is too much over the top. Sometime later, God called Abraham and he said, Abraham. And Abraham said, here I am. And God said, take your son Isaac, your only son, whom you love. Which isn't true, by the way, because Abraham has another son, Ishmael, from his wife's slave, Hagar. And that's Ishmael, yeah. yeah. So it's not the only son, maybe it's the only son that he loves. Yeah, that's it, because he got rid of the rest of them. So this is the only son Abraham loves. Take him and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Well, it's a little easier to see how Abraham might have got confused <laughs> and thought that God wanted him to actually kill his son when God said uh, sacrifice him as a burnt offering. Uh, so Abraham follows along and grabs a couple of slaves because, you know, that's just what you did back then. Hey, you slaves, we're going to pick up some wood. We're going to go up here. And uh, he heads up to the mountain, and in verse 5, he tells his servants, you guys stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Uh, that verse is important when I get to what apologists have to say. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, because, you know, you're going to kill him anyway. You might as well make him carry the stuff up there. The two of them go up together, and Isaac looks up at his father, and he says, Father, and Abraham says, Yes, my son. Uh, the fire and the wood are here, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? <laughs> God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on, and when they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Well, it doesn't say anything about Isaac being terrified. So clearly he wasn't. <laughs> I feel so much better. For years I've sat here and read this verse and had ignored what Isaac might be feeling. And I remember one time after I was actually an atheist, somebody came up to me and said, have you ever thought about what's going through Isaac's mind? Your dad's got you carrying the wood up there. You, there's no sheep or ram about. Your dad thinks he hears voices. <laughs> And then he binds you and sets you on the altar. I think I'd be shitting my pants right about that <laughs> and doing whatever I could. But the Bible skips that, so we are just to assume that Isaac wasn't afraid. There are some apologists who will tell you that God put Isaac into a deep sleep so he wasn't aware of any of this. They are doing what all apologists do, which is making shit up. <laughs> So he bound his son and he reached out with his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And an angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he says, don't lay a hand on the boy. Do nothing to him. For now that I know you fear God. Hey, wait a minute. There's a word that wasn't in that book. Fear. It was all about, does Abraham love God? Now it's about fear. Uh, now that I know you fear God, which could be interpreted as respect, which might be love which explains my, why my wife terrifies me sometimes. I, uh... <laughs> and Abraham went over and then God had provided a ram and killed that. And we don't have to go through anything else that's in this story. There were people who came up to me. I, I was walked down the aisle at the age of five and accepted Jesus into my heart and was active in the church. And of course, my mom will tell a slightly different story today about you know, what they thought about whether or not I was saved. And it doesn't matter. But I was raised with this idea repeatedly that God loves you, God is love.
God has provided a way for you to escape hell. God has done all of this, created all of this for you. You're special. And he loves you so much. You are drowning and you don't know about it. And God is providing you a life jacket. And with that particular framing of the story, I knew my friends were going to hell. But it didn't terrify me. And I wasn't ever really traumatized or terrified of hell because I was saved. And it wasn't that, hey, these people are going to be tortured and punished forever. It's, hey, we've got a way for you to avoid that. That framing keeps it positive. And then I met some people who have lived their life in anxiety because the very same story to them left them with the message, I have done something so terrible or will do something so terrible that God had to kill somebody to make up for it. And that's a fundamentally different view of the story. This storybook talks about love wanting Abraham to bring little Isaac to him. That Abraham was confused because God would never demand a sacrifice. That's those other gods. There's prescriptions in the Bible to prevent against sacrificing children. Except there's also verses where that's exactly what happens with Jephthah and others. But there's excuses. There's apologetic excuses. There's tap dances to get out of all of it or almost all of it by framing it in a different way. God didn't understand, or Abraham didn't understand what God wanted him to do. It's all Abraham's fault. We know that God had this plan. Let me tell you the truth about this story. The objective, undeniable truth straight from the doctrine, and that's this. God, as you'll be told by apologists, wasn't testing Abraham so that God could discover if Abraham really loved him or feared him. God already knows that. God was testing Abraham so Abraham would know and understand or so that somebody else would see this and know and understand. God already knew. So if you're going to go attacking this story, don't go anywhere near that. Why would God have to test Abraham? Doesn't God know everything? Because <laughs> that's never going to fly with a believer because they've already done that dance. God knows he was testing for Abraham's sake. But what kind of test is that? If I'm trying to find out that you love me and understand me, and that you have a good understanding of who I am and what I would want you to do. And I am the kind of God that is absolutely opposed to sacrificing children. Then when God comes to you and says, sacrifice your child, the one and only right answer is, depart from me, foul spirit. You can't possibly be my God. My God would never demand something like that from me. That's the only right answer from a biblical standpoint. And yet the right answer that was rewarded was, okay, I'll do it. Now, if you're God and you're, you're opposed to sacrificing children and you say to somebody, let's see if how, how well they know me, uh, go and sacrifice your child. And that guy says, okay, no, you clearly don't understand me. There's no way I would ever ask you to do that. This is the message you need to deliver to everybody. Not that I would demand it, but that I absolutely wouldn't demand it. You failed the test. The only successful pass of that test is to say, no, that's not what God is. But because the Bible portrays this as a pass, the test was satisfactory. That means the God of the Bible rewarded Abraham for having a correct understanding that he could demand anything up to and including sacrificing your own child. And there is no apologetic twisting and turning that can get out of that. Now, there's other books that are on the screen. They do it differently. Some of them ignore the story of Abraham and Isaac entirely. As I'm flipping through, it goes from like Noah to Joseph. And I'm like, hang on, a second. there's like a couple of generations there and you even skip the Tower of Babel and everything. What's going on here? Uh, others are a little more honest. They will include uh, direct quotes about uh, setting up a, burning, a, a, sacrifice, a sacrifice with a burning altar. I really need this story to happen with a lot of slaughter. This has to be what God's thinking. I've got this, I've got this book and I wanna, wanna convey a message to everybody and there really needs to be a lot of slaughter in there because I need kids to be able to read it. Oh, wait a minute, that people would just make stuff up and twist it and turn it and provide the softest possible message to the children. 
So that when you go to Sunday school, and when you go to your GAs and all the other stuff that you know, Southern Baptists like myself formerly did, and you ride the bus and you sing all those songs that stick in your head until you're 48 or more, I know I can't get rid of them now. Go away. Uh, no. Package. Package. Okay, I, I, got, I got something else in there now other than this song. This is the path that they use to influence the kids. Because despite what, they, what this woman thinks about them understanding spiritual things, adults don't even understand spiritual things. Spiritual is a nonsense word that can mean anything to anybody. It's a placeholder, it's a cowardly term, and it doesn't edify anyone about anything. What those children are doing is not understanding spirituality. They are relating to fairy tales and fantasy, which is exactly what she said she wanted to do. Let's make this so that it's as palatable as a Saturday morning cartoon, and that way it'll stick in their head. Because once the base of the story sticks in their head, the truth of what the story actually says can now be excused. All those years where God loves you and he's trying to save you, it never occurred to me that this was going to traumatize people for years. And I do this shit for a living, both before and after, to some extent. You heard Randy say, teach kids how to think and not what to think. You've heard me say it, I probably stole it from him, or I don't know. I'd love to claim vice versa, but uh, one, of my, one of my favorite moments in the entire time I've been active in the atheist and skeptic community uh, is Randy quoted me in an, ep an edition of the Swift magazine because I was writing for this absolute trash website where anybody could come and say anything. And there was a guy who would come in and he would give sermons and he went by a pseudonym of uh, Skip to Malou. And he would pick out a verse, a passage, and he would write a sermon. And I was a budding, fledgling atheist who had just discovered that all the stuff I thought I knew about the Bible was probably not as accurate as I had thought. And so I would go and take the exact same passage and write a counter sermon showing how these verses could be interpreted in a completely different way and point out that this is how we end up with over a thousand denominations that identify as Christian. But there were also a bunch of woo peddlers out there, and I wrote a debunking about this guy who was advocating for Indian gurus who didn't have to eat, they survived on prana, sunlight. And, uh, and I wrote something, and I don't know how it got, Randy got directed to this absolutely garbage website, uh, but he did, but he pulled it out and quoted it at the end of uh, Swift. I wish I'd saved it because I, I can't find it in the archive. But as I was going through and doing all of that, I was working through taking the baggage that had been injected to me as a child that softened all these things and trying to analyze them as objectively as possible. Now, as I said, I don't have kids. So my advice is probably going to be better than any parent's about what you should do with your own kids. But I was a kid. And not only do I think you should teach them how to think instead of what to think, but you have to talk honestly to kids. I understand you're gonna, I, when I, I don't even baby talk to infants. I talk to them like they're real people, even though they're not, they won't be until they're in my phone book. But <laughs> I, I talk to them as if they were real people. And I think we should talk to kids honesty, honestly. You can begin teaching the foundations of skepticism and critical thinking just as soon as you're able to communicate with them. Tell them what you believe and why, not in an indoctrinating sense to turn them into atheists or set up an expectation of atheism. That's probably gonna happen. Even someone like me who was indoctrinated from the age of four or five and served through all, I was 30, 30 plus when I found my way out. There's a way out of this. And while the indoctrination will pester me for the rest of my life, with the songs coming up at inappropriate times, but I'm inappropriate in general anyway, so I don't mind. <laughs> Let your kids know that you love them, even if they believe differently from you. Don't assume when they tell you they believe something that you don't, that it's just a phase. Don't assume that they're just rebelling. And this doesn't just apply to religious things. If they come out and tell you that they're questioning their gender identity or their sexuality or anything else, 
Don't just dismiss it as a phase. Don't just pretend like you have the answers. Be ready and willing at the drop of a hat to not only say, I don't know, but to say, I don't know, but let's see if we can find a way to discover what the answer is. Encourage and instill in them a spirit of inquiry, of curiosity. When they show up with an interest, no matter how bizarre and, and, and ridiculous you think it is, do what you can to encourage them to go after their passion. Because we are here to support them. We are here to nurture them. Children aren't property at all. You're here as a guardian, as a tutor, as a mentor to those children. They are not your property. Now, it's a difficult decision to make about when someone should step in into somebody else's parenting. When, the, when should the state step in? You know, if, if there's a parents over here who are teaching their kids that left is right and right is left, you know, is that child abuse? Yes. Uh, is it probably going to fix itself as soon as they get out into the real world? Yes. But you've made it more difficult for them, so don't do that. Your kids are not there for you to experiment on. You're going to experiment enough, trust me. It's, it, it, I've watched my brother, I've watched my family. Uh, kids are unfortunate, ex unfortunately experiments. They shouldn't be viewed as experiments. Be open to disagreement. Be open to being challenged by your kids. There's no answer that is less satisfying than because I said so. And this is the answer that religions like Christianity foster for the very foundation of everything they want people to believe. Why is this true? Because God said so. Well, so what? Because Captain Kirk said so. Because Yogi the Clown said so. Please give me a reason for that. Be open to disagreement. I'm not talking about, you know, don't, you know, kids are going to rebel, kids are going to test your boundaries, have boundaries, have good boundaries that encourage them. But you're not always right. And saying, because I said so, doesn't teach them a thing. Have good reasons and good reasoning. Now, I'm all in favor of having as many atheists in the world as we can get. I'm a skeptic, I'm a humanist, I'm an atheist, probably in that order. They're all, that doesn't mean that like being an atheist is vastly insignificant. It's not. But here's the bad news, which I'm going to say at the American Atheist Convention on Sunday before an eclipse. Atheism isn't the answer to the problems of the world. Atheism on its own is not the answer to anything. It's a position on whether or not there's a God. But there's a lot of things that get attached onto it that are the answers. If you want to talk about the answer to problems are critical thinking, skepticism, and the application of humanism, that gets you to solutions because atheism isn't offering solutions. But atheism is a conclusion, for me, based on skepticism. It's not as important to me that someone ends up an atheist as that they end up an, a skeptic, a humanist, and a decent person. Because I think the atheism happens on its own once you get those other ones done. But Matt, why are you on the board of directors for American Atheists? Why do you host the Atheist Experience TV show? Why do you have a, a, a Patreon channel called Atheist Debates? It's atheist, 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 yes. Because I'm a former Christian who knows that area, and I want the world to be filled with as many atheists as I can. But I want them to be skeptical, humanistic, reasoning, good atheists. Not just people who don't believe in God. You can, you can not believe in a God for any number of awful reasons. Oh, I wanted a bicycle when I was five, and I prayed, and God didn't give it to me, so screw him. You can be an atheist and not support church state separation. Turn on Fox News and see S.E. Cup up there. She's, I, she's an atheist. Not on our side of anything, as far as I can tell. Teach kids how to think, encourage curiosity, discovery, inquiry, answer honestly. And Dave Silverman said something the other day that I love. He says lots of things that I love. Not everything. I disagree with everybody in the movement on something, including myself, at least once a day. But he said, we're right, and we should act like it. And I agree wholeheartedly. And when you're right, you have no need to exaggerate. You have no need to lie. You have no need to threaten. 
Faith is the excuse people give when they don't have a good reason. If you have good reasons, you offer those reasons when asked. Nobody's ever had to say, I'm going to take it on faith that there's an eclipse tomorrow. It's science, scientific examination of evidence that led us to that. Now you watch, it'll cloud over and I won't have the proof that I need. <laughs> because I said so isn't just a bad reason. It's not even a reason, excuse. It's faith. It encourages faith. It encourages someone to act merely based on a claim of authority. I think if we look around the world right now, we can see that authoritarian faith-based claims are killing us every single day and terrifying people every single day. It is not the way to a better world. These are just assertions. Oh, do it because I'm right. Do it because they're wrong. Do it because religion is bullshit or do it because religion is evil. Those are just assertions about the way things are. They are not explanations. They don't encourage any sort of understanding. They don't edify anybody. They don't give them an understanding about how to live their lives and why they're doing it. It just creates faith-based robots. I think that's my alarm. Time to do the TV show. There's another Bible story about a house built on a rock and a house built on sand. Now set aside whether or not you'd be stuck with a rock front yard or a sand front yard. The, the point of the story is about having a good foundation. And it's a great story. It is, apart from possibly doubting Thomas, the closest thing to skepticism that I've found in the Bible. Well, I, your reasons for believing something should be solid. Not so solid that you're not willing to change your mind when a better foundation comes along, but solid. Theism doesn't have a solid foundation, which is probably why someone came up with this little parable, so they could pretend like they had a solid foundation. But that's why this room is overflowing with former believers, folks who found out that the foundation upon which their beliefs rested was weak. If you build atheism on a weak foundation, bad arguments, claims of fallacies that aren't, you're not doing anyone any favors. We're right, and we should act like it. We know we're right because we have good reasons. We know we're right because we've investigated the claims. We know we're right because we've come out of being wrong. People aren't, aren't so much terrified of being wrong, they're, they're terrified of being exposed as wrong. That's the fear. Oh my gosh, someone's going to find out I'm wrong. As soon as you realize that you're probably wrong about a great many things, just like everybody else, identifying that you're wrong is not a big deal anymore. Because what it does is it gives you the opportunity to stop being wrong. And when you raise children and you give them bad foundations, you are setting them up for this terrifying proposition of being exposed as being wrong. And are you preparing them for that? How many people got called to the blackboard? Well, all right, uh, that's my age. <laughs> you're in class and you're asked to give an answer that you don't know. And you're terrified. We reinforce this terror in kids all the time, not just the kids, and they're awful. They're like little sociopaths. <laughs> I love them, but they're like little sociopaths. Ah, you didn't know the answer. I'm going to mock you. I'm going to make fun of you. Make fun of you because you didn't know the answer. I'm going to make fun of you because you did know the answer. You're too smart. You're part of that bookworm click. I'm going to make fun of you because you're too much of a jock. I'm going to make fun of you because you're too fat. I'm going to make fun of you because you look different or you're poor or you're a different color. Rah, rah, rah. And teachers reinforce this terror of not knowing the answer, of being different, of being out. Best thing we can do, or one of the best things we can do, is to cut that stuff out by teaching them from the get-go that sometimes the one and only right answer is I don't know. When we portray a confidence level in a belief that is disproportionate to what it should be, yes, I'm paraphrasing Hume, my 
favorite philosopher, that said the wise man proportions his belief to the evidence. And what he was talking about is your confidence level should be proportional to the evidence support. When we pretend as if we have a confidence level that's justified when it might not be, we put ourselves on an even footing with all the things that we're opposed to in religions. That's what they're doing. And when we encourage our kids to have that same sort of bravado and confidence about what they, my dad could beat up your dad. I know it, my dad's, you know, and, and they'll lie to back this up. Religions use books like this and people who think like this to bolster false confidence in children, to encourage authoritarian-based, faith-based, overconfidence in their beliefs and it is destroying the world and it has been and we as skeptics as humanists as atheists as american atheists have a moral obligation to stand up against that to do our best to teach kids how to think not what to think to teach them that they're all right the way they are that they weren't born bad and that the best answer they can give is I don't know, and that they are gonna to have to fix the world that we allowed to remain unfixed. Thank you.